Hello and welcome to the Bodyline Pro podcast. My name is Isaac Osborne, founder and CEO of Bodyline Pro. In this podcast, we interview practitioners who use Bodyline Pro and some of the leading experts in the health industry who are committed to taking a scientific approach to improving the form and function of the body and the growth and development of their practice. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Be sure to check out the show notes for links. For more information about Bodyline Pro, visit BodylinePro.com. Welcome to episode nine of the Body Align Pro podcast. In this episode, our guest is Stephen Braybook. Stephen has over 70 sports and fitness qualifications, such as Pilates, personal training, etc., along with an undergraduate and master's degree in sports and exercise biomechanics. He's the author of The Evolution of Biomechanics. Make sure to check out the show notes for the link to his book, his podcast, and his website. Steven and I review his book, The Evolution of Biomechanics, and talk about his call for a shift in what's missing in the world of biomechanics, how he's worked with his clients in the past and how he works with his clients now, and much, much more. It goes really deep, so I really hope you enjoy the show. Here's Steven. Steven, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm grateful to have you on the show. I've been reading your book, The, uh, the History of Biomechanics. And I've really, really enjoyed your book. I feel, I feel that you have taken all the books that I've read, condensed them with your history of biomechanics in the first part of your book, and you outlined, you outlined them in a way of really asking questions of are we really experiencing or – challenging the reality of, of, of these, these theories and ways to look at the body. I really enjoyed that. I don't really want to talk about so much the history of biomechanics unless it really, for some re- reason that we have to reference it. Uh, I really want to talk about, I'm really excited about what you're presenting in your book. And to, to start off, I want to read a quote from Korzy- Korzybski that you put in the beginning of your book. And uh, the, the quote is, a map is not the territory it represents, but if correct, it has a similar structure to the territory, which accounts for its usefulness. Alfred Korzybski. Uh, is that from Science and Sanity? I read that yes. book. Uh, man, that book put me, put me to sleep. Every time I could read a page and I'd be out. And, uh, so, Dr. Rolf, uh, she was a big fan of Korzybski as well. And just looking at the different ways of, of uh, reality and sanity, so to speak, is huh. great. You, in your book, you state, I strongly believe that the biomechanical view of the human body is outdated. That's one, I'm, I'm just picking stuff from your book here. Yep. My real passion and respect for human, mov- for human movement, and unfortunately, I feel that biomechanics as a subject area does not do human movement justice from a theoretical standpoint. I strongly believe that we are ready to take the theory of human movement to a more elevated understanding than the current universally accepted perspective. And you go on to explain, talk about what this is, and at, towards the end of the book, you, you, you lead into biokinesis ontology. Love that word. And um, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read this as well, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get going on, on the questions. Uh, I have termed the alternative t- to biomechanics and the new theory of movement biokinesis ontology. Biokinesis ontology is a portmanteau of the terms biology, kinesis, and ontology. Biology is a scientific study of living organisms. Kinesis is the Greek word for movement or motion. Ontology is a branch of philosophical metaphysics concerned with the study of the nature of reality. Ontology is a prerequisite for physics and motion, but does not need to take into consideration any mathematics associated with it. Whew, that's good stuff. Cool. Can you give me where you're at now 
with biokinesis ontology. And maybe, maybe a, a, a short explanation of it from your, your perspective so our viewers and listeners can, can um, understand it. We have uh, listeners that are, that are laymen and practitioners, so we want to we wanna, uh, speak to both of those, of both of that audience. Yeah, I think firstly, the thing is with the world of biomechanics, I think in the last five to 10 years, biomechanics is, has infiltrated, the word has infiltrated into all kinds of movement ideologies. And that's where one of the reasons where the book started from was the fact that I was seeing some movement ideologies, movement practitioners, movement practices that were embedded in so much human forms of, of movement and understanding the human as a whole to then trying to justify itself and feeling that it needed to have this biomechanical language to represent itself and justify itself into, into being real. Uh, body work, working, for example, in the yoga, for example, I know a lot of yoga instructors that would do things and say things and, and, and work from the body from the inside out and started to, started to think they had to use these mechanical type words to justify what they were doing. The actual experimentation of feeling and understanding the nature of the free flying internal structures uh, wasn't enough after how many hundreds of thousands of years. Now they had to have these, I had to speak about levers and had to speak about forces and they had to speak about principles of Newtonian physics and look at geometry of motion. You're thinking, this is, doesn't do you any credibility whatsoever. And one of the reasons the book came out is to give back real language to movement practitioners without falsifying what they're trying to do with ideologies and principles that, as the book explains, have no relevance to human form. And I think that was something that I was finding quite upsetting, that people were taking the beautiful art of movement and having to dissect it with the theoretical ideology of language, which has no representation of movement whatsoever. Uh, and for me, it's, I think it's one of the things that's come out from the book is people are starting to understand that they don't need to use the traditional biomechanical language that, as I said in the book, is built for innate objects that have no relevance to life whatsoever to try to justify what they're doing. And that's one of the beautiful things come out of it. I think the, the, the word with biokinesis ontology is an understanding that the mathematical body is only going to be represented if you are producing artificial components on the body or trying to represent something that is being with the body. I think that was the key things. You know, one of the key things with mathematical equations were Firstly, you can never do the same movement twice. So representing the same movement again and again has to be falsified into trying to find a constant. Uh, math mathematics and biomechanics only works when you find a constant. The same setup, the same design, the same principles over and over again because you have to use the same, same foundational numbers to justify where you're coming from. So one of the things that I strongly am not really too concerned with is it's not so much the mathematics that you're trying to equate an artificial point in time with, it's the movement itself. It's looking at what type of posture, what type of shape represents this movement. And even that was starting to lose a little bit of its form when things like biotensegrity came onto the market and people start speaking about tensegrity as in this shapeless form without understanding that the ideology that but Mr. Fuller still came out with was a artificial shape built on finding perfect angles. Uh, so one of the key things with King's ontology from a practical perspective is for the individual not to find a predetermined shape based on equations of mathematics, um, based on ge geometrical shapes, which are only mathematically equated through biomechanics when you're looking at an innate object, an artificial two-dimensional piece of drawn on a paper, is to look upon it upon, there is no correct shape when you do a movement. I think that's one of the beautiful things that, that Bioclear has come up with, you know, there's, there's a representation of what you think a squat is, but actually the representation of your internal system of how you're going to manipulate to get in that position is fast. 
and allowing someone not to be robotic by commanding biomechanical principles upon them gives them freedom. And I think that was one of the things that I was finding up certainly when I was looking at a lot of yoga. Uh, the non-conformable asset of yoga into a conformable mechanical principle and the clients were looking very robotic in that nature. And to me, that defeats the purpose of movement whatsoever because movement should be up to the individual of how they express themselves during that motion in the activity or the movement of their design. Not having not gone into it with a predetermined teaching that you can't do A or you can't do B and mathematically you shouldn't be doing C and the lever doesn't work in this principle here and too much force to go through. And it's these sort of little bit of ideology, especially on the lever systems, which you've got, you know, you've only got three degrees of freedom at most joints. You can only do flexion extension on the knee. You can only do flexion extension on the elbow. If you go into rotation any of those, there's going to be issues in the body. Well, again, you're setting, yourself, setting someone up to walk mechanically and move mechanically and pretty preempt movements that they should be getting into, but they're not going to get into because they're now is built upon this mechanical principle. And that's the key to biomechanics. The education that biomechanics teaches not only is falsifiable when you come in and look at human movement and how the internal structure works. It also is falsifiable because it gives people knowledge where they perceive that's the way it should be done within movement. And more importantly, that gives them a cognitive understanding that this way it should be done. So they don't only move that way. They think that's the only way they should move. And you are basically boxing an individual in from the multiple planes of angles and, and vectors, if you want to use those words, and the multiple incomprehensible social organizational variables that an individual can have at any moment. You're boxing them into this very artificial, which is not even a 3D environment. You teach them 2D environments and you're boxing them in, you're making their mind smaller, but also their physical ability within the action smaller. And to me, that's, that's not how movement is. Mm -hmm. So when, when you, and I absolutely agree, it, it's, it's from, take it down into a short condensed version of everything you just said. If I'm understanding you correctly, um, it's, it's that, it's the idea of changing the body from the outside in rather than rather than from the inside out. Yes. And, and I'm absolutely guilty of using the, the, the model of levers and tensegrity and, and I don't, you know, I don't whip myself for it because we're trying to use the current tools to, to, to describe to our, our patients, clients, our current understanding of what we're trying to do when, when there's a lot about it that we don't understand. And th that's why I really appreciate your book is you're calling the, you're calling the community out to, go, to say, this doesn't represent what we're actually doing. It's nowhere, it, and it's, it's not really even close in a lot of ways to, to the magnificence of the human body and its, its intelligence. So, yeah, and, I, and, I th and I think that's, that's one of the issues. I think I, I don't have, I don't have a, a dislike to some of the terminology used mm -hmm. I, because words are just words. They, they, they mean nothing. They only mean something when there's a backstory or a history to it. Right. And I think that's one of the things I say in the book is I, I don't say not use the word levers any, in any practice. Right. But if you understand what a lever is in traditional physics and biomechanics hasn't changed the ideology of the, not only the mathematics we equate a lever, but just by the sheer principles of the ideologies of what lever is, mm -hmm. they haven't changed it. And that's the issue. You know, biomechanics, what the thing to remember biomechanics, and this is, biomechanics is a made up subject. It's not like physiology or biology or neurology or psychology, which has multiple, multiple years of study and education. Biomechanics is a purely made up subject from the aspects of physics. Mm -hmm. that's, that's basically biomechanics. You know, uh, Borelli, the first Lieberman principle who is spoken of as one of the forefathers of biomechanics, decided on a particular day that he saw animals move and he could equate those for his mathematics or physics, then that's how man should move. Mm -hmm. So when it, 
but you understand that biomechanics is a made up subject, which still has a huge amount of relevance. If you're finding an object from the hand or you're hitting a tennis ball and you put an artificial limbs in, that is why you can never get an artificial limb that represents the, the, the limb that was lost. You can mathematically equate it and put biomechanical and physics principles into that artificial limb, but it will never in a million years represent anything close to the limb that you lost. Because it, whatever happens, it's still mechanical. Absolutely. And, 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 phys and, physics, is, and physics is still mechanical. You know, right. physics was, was born in a mechanical world because the ideologies around when physics with Isaac Newton became very uh, popular was built on a very mechanical principles of mm. the three-point system of the Earth, Moon and Sun and trying to equate uh, their point in space. Because you can't equate three random points in space, you can equate two still constant points, but the third one's completely random. Then Isaac Newton decided calculus to actually give me three numbers. Then somehow in that calculator equation, dissect one number and bring it back to two, two dimension field anyway. So it's just, it's just a fancy way of, of reducing three dimensions into two dimensions and right. justifying that you've got three dimensions to start with. So right. Bobby can just brought upon physics and physics is, is, is purely based upon innate objects that will find very similar, if not, permanent consistencies you know me push my phone across the table me fry an apple into the air you know apple the same height same weight same environment it's going to get pretty much the same constant equations so it's very it's very predictable mm -hmm. quantum physics on the other hand we understand is very uh non-systematic non-logical it's random right. it's complete and utter theoretical but the traditional physics which biomechanics is built upon is purely mechanical um biomechanics is just used or just termed Fibrelli, it's just used that physical principles into man without any changes. And that's the key to it. There's been no changes. Mm -hmm. Nothing's been manipulated, nothing's been modified, nothing's been adapted. There has been no changes whatsoever. Yeah. And then, and then biomechanics took upon and used and as it's used now. Like mm -hmm. I say, if you're finding a tennis ball, you're finding a cricket ball, hitting a soccer ball, you know, I understand that. That's fine. You can equate that through the physics. But when you're looking at the internal structure, and you're looking at the amount of joints available and the amount of even traditional six degree of freedom when you're looking at the mechanicals of, you know, your free linear and your free rotational. And you equate those, you equate the amount of joints you have with the amount of traditional uh, ways that that particular joint can move. You're talking thousands mm -hmm. upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of configurations that that joint can go through at each second of a motion. So when you're looking at the amount joints, the mm -hmm. amount of movements, even by a traditional language, it can move up, and you're talking over 30, 30 to 40,000 different configurations that can go on at any second during, let's say, a gate cycle, and your gate cycle lasts five seconds, there is an impossibility to equate what is happening at that moment in time with any mathematics whatsoever. Right. And, and, and that, and if I, if I may interject here, I just want to uh, bring up from your book here, you, your, your proposed properties of biokinesis ontology is uh, an integral complete system that operates as a whole, stiff enough to bear loads yet supple enough to transfer force and vibration consisting of joint spaces rather than conventional joints. I like that because uh, I think at one point, Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, joint spaces create the concept of floating bones via the new, 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 <laughs> do I, my, pneumodraulic, am, am I pronouncing yeah. that correctly? Yep. Because that's, yeah. that's a new word I think you, you yep. created in here. And bioelectromagnetic systems. This is something that is not talked about, but I've, I've seen papers on this postula, postulizing, um, postulating that these exist in the body and they do exist in the body for instance you used uh an example of sound waves in here you use example of you know piezoelectricity and vibration and how that affects the body and how that affects the body and so you're absolutely correct that that the field of biomechanics is not whoop is not taking this into into consideration when we when we look at bodies okay. and i and there's there's, I, there's I, no sorry, I, I, Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I spent uh, many years in, in academic biomechanics, uh, master's level. Uh, uh, and 
the reason the PhD wasn't uh, wasn't taken up by me is because of the book because I I I, I lost I lost uh, I lost my love for biomechanics traditional work because from day one I was always a biomechanist in some sort of form whether it's looking at posture analysis or kinesiology and movement uh, assessments or just you know movement itself uh, applied movement whichever you want to call it biomechanics is always a sort of the holy grail uh, and on all my time in biomechanical academia i only had one one hour lecture on vibration i had one one hour lecture on vibration and it, if i remember rightly it was a very traditional uh, here in the uk vibration in the emphasis of mechanical vibration if you're using jackhammers and things like that what it does to the body the white noise syndrome that's the only vibration we had and even then it was a, via a machinery mm -hmm. We had no, there was no other, no other knowledge on vibration in the system. And how can you have an understanding of biomechanics, which is the form of biological movement, and without the understanding of the principles behind not even traditional vibration, mm -hmm. but just vibration in general? Right. When every, everything you do is vibration, whether you want to call it spiritual vibration, whether you want to call it a, a higher plane than us vibration, just purely academic vibration when you put your foot to the floor mm -hmm. when you put your hand on the table when you get up from a chair when you sneeze when you cough when you go to the toilet it's all vibration and without having the understanding that the skeletal system which is bearing our weight has so much more than just bearing our weight giving a shape etc etc it is a conduct for the rest of the body mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's the conduct within the within the within the, the the system of the skeletal bones. There is forces which are electrical. There's forces which are magnetic. There's water forces. There's push and pull forces within opposite polars. There's all kinds of unheard of forces that are going to. The, you could even say, and I, I say it. You know, the closest thing that we're going to get to quantum mechanics is actually the human body. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the closest we're going to get. Mm -hmm. is, you, know, you can justify quantum mechanics to the outside body, but the actual inside body is quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Because you know, the electrical forces and the magnetic forces and, the, and, and, and the, the water forces and the space gaps in between each one is all there to produce an upright body which is designed on paper to be flat on the floor if we believe that gravitational forces are as they are. Mm -hmm. So... If we are designed to oppose gravity, then we are having so much more things going on in our system which are non-mechanical and follow no current principles of ideology of biomechanics. Because if it did, we'd be on the floor lying down. Absolutely. We wouldn't be able to stand. So those gravitational forces are not us. We don't, we were, we were, we're anti-gravity. We uh, were an anti-gravity. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely built to be anti-gravity. Anti absolutely. You, you go, and, you go and do a Google search and you put anti-gravity and you'll find nothing. You'll find out the no. gravi anti-gravity in space and you might find anti-gravity machines that people are tempted to, but you'll find nothing on anti-gravity in the system. No. So, so this brings to the question of, this is great because you've really outlined what you're talking about. So how do you, how do you bring this into your practice? What different approach? So it's, it, let's use an example. Someone comes in with, neck pain or back pain or or just says you know I, I i don't run as fast as i used to can you can you walk us through uh your steps as as a practitioner and I, i'm assuming you're still in you're still mm. still in practice mm. um what what you would do with somebody like that when they when they come in how do, how do you look at how do you talk to them how do you look look at them are you still using exercises um because if I know if I talk about a little bit what I see on Instagram, it's it's, it's mostly about the brain. If I, if if I'm understanding correctly, uh, what I'm seeing, yeah. and so would you talk about your approach a little bit while when you yeah. work with people? I think one of the things things to to to, to remember, and it's especially someone that I work with predominantly, is everybody is born with a non mechanical body. And it's the life that they lead that looks from an outside in to be a mechanical body. Mm -hmm. But everyone is born and everyone has the, has, has the, the internal structure of a non-mechanical 
non-Newtonial, non-Borelli, non, non-biomechanical non principle of a body. And no idea how to use it either. <laughs> and they got no, but they have it. This, this is the key. They have it. So one, one of the, th- the biggest thing I work on is, and people say this all the time, is the closest, th- the closest time in your life when you were not mechanical in any shape or form and you had the whole internal system work in the way that's designed to work, which we still don't understand, but using the principles of electrical dynamic forces, looking at hydraulic and amplifying effects in the system where it expands against, against, against a sheath or fascia, which then it gives information back in and you've got these gaps between each one. You've got the free flowing dynamics of water flying around, which gives us a stiffness in certain parts and reduce it in another. The old yin and yang principles of, you know, opposite polars and or magnetic forces that are pushing things away and pulling them together. All these kinds of, we have that. And we had that as children. Mm-hmm. And people say, well, let's go back to children-like mentality or children-like movements. And it's not the movements in a child that produces this non-mechanical body. It's the, free, it's the freedom in thought that produces non-mechanical body. Children don't have no preconceptions of how they should move. They move by repeating things over and over again and finding their own way of carrying the activity out. Self-organization is a beautiful thing if you let it, if you let it go. Do you say that the children observe at all as, as movements around them as well? That, and that, that yep. observation influences, influencing, influences them as well? See their parent move, they'll copy their parent. If they see their, uh, their, their teacher move, they'll copy their teacher. If they see a cat move, they'll copy a cat. They see a, a dog move, they copy a dog. Mm-hmm. They have no idea what is right or what is wrong. All they know is, how does it feel when I'm doing it? If it looks strange to someone else, but feels great for me, it's the way my body should be moving. If it feels good, if it feels bad to me, but it's accepted by society, then the chances are, it's not the way you should be moving. So my big thing is, and I say this all the time, is I will find in my movement the best way I can get the human body to be non-mechanical and to work on all the principles that biokinesis ontology is looking into is to give freedom of expression back to the individual. And the greatest form that I say is for free, one of the greatest forms of freedom of expression is to dance like no one is watching. Because when you dance like no one is watching, all you care about is the emotion and the feelings that come along with the dance. You listen to your favorite music and you're moving in ways that if you took a picture or you took a camera, it would be the complete opposite to biomechanics. Mm -hmm. You could not equate the next step from the next step. You put a form in there and you put style and you then try to teach something, then you can predict. But it's not movement. It's artificial movement that is only serving a secondary goal, which is to look good if you're in a dance class or to lift a big weight if you're going to squat. And that's okay if you want to be that specific. But this, I think one of the key things to understand is movement is very a general term. Real movement, life movement, has no real end goal to it. It's a consistent flow of how you're feeling at the time. Specific movement has a purpose of an end goal. There's another repetition here. There's another repetition here. I will hit this certain pose. I will sit this nice standing posture. My back's mm-hmm. got to be straight when I sit down. Mm-hmm. All these predetermined, that's specific goals. Rule, rule movement is letting the person do what they want to do at that particular moment with how they feel at that moment. And I always, in my, in my, in my clients, I'm part of brain movement, is to give back the freedom of expression to that individual, to teach them that your self-image and your body understanding and your body image is not built upon a mechanical ideology. It's built upon a feeling of does it feel right for you? Because if you go into an activity and you're saying to yourself, oh, my knee can't go internally or externally, then there isn't, there isn't much you can do unless you put someone into a squat rack and hopefully go up or down. But even then, any deviations that size central of the knee, you're not going to get the weight up. So if you could compare, I'm, I'm assuming uh, um, that in the past you worked pretty biomechanically with, with your clients. Yes. And the response of your clients at that time and your results that you got at that at that time compared to compared to now with the way that you're working with bio biokinesis ontology and your perspective of helping them express again the movement that they have lost 
or, or the expression essentially that they have lost in their movement. Uh, are you seeing, are you seeing faster results? Are you, are you feeling, are you seeing more permanent changes from individuals? Uh, what have you noticed? Yeah, I think the one thing that from, from previously when I was more biomechanical minded is I had to, from that understanding when I was in that frame of mind, was you always revert it back to clinical line, your hip position had to be in certain position in relation to the shoulder. You always revert back to the knee, couldn't go over the toe, and if it did, there was a problem. And you know, you always went back to the foot and looked at the information the foot was giving it through the different motions. And you always, you always went back to lines. You always went back to basic geometry lines because you're saying that if that's correct, then I can load upon this system and load upon that system, and eventually the load would dissipate and it would go down. And that worked like a treat until they moved. Until they one day picked something up from the floor or danced with their wife or played with their children or just done another sport that required a little bit more motion. Mm -hmm. Then things became slightly problematic mm -hmm. because these things weren't sticking. And then you go one step further and you go, okay, well, let's, let's start to look at joint actions and try to give you more internal rotation in the, and they give you more ex, you know, extension of the spine and give you more supination or pronation of the foot if that's what you're lacking and be a little bit more even even more analytical analytical and look at the biomechanical principles of each joint but like i said you know the amount of joints that gone on during one stride of gait and the amount of variations within those spaces that the joints can move in i i can't tell you that you should be in pronation or supination there's seven billion people on the planet that will walk entirely differently and you'll walk entirely differently from the next one Mm -hmm. So I can't tell you whether you should be in pronation or supination. I have a highly supinated right foot because of many, many, many injuries on my knee. And I've never had back pain and I've never, you know, and I, I, I work my body. My mum has in complete internal pronation of her feet and she's 75 and she's never had back pain. And so we all will have, let's say, joint abnormalities mm -hmm. to the outside world. That you look and go, oh yeah, that's your ankle doesn't look too good there. Oh yeah, you got too much supination there. And the body's gone. That's just me. I can deal with this. Are mm -hmm. you telling me that my 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 whole internal system, from the biochemistry ontology perspective, on the you know the, the 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 brain the brain ideology perspective, you're telling me I'm not smart enough to have a get out of jail card. Mm -hmm. You're telling Absolutely. me that I'm not smart enough. If I have one deviation of pronation of foot and the other one's too much in supination, I'm going to come tumbling down. Like, no, you, let's give our bodies a bit more credit than that. Mm -hmm. Now, there are individuals, don't get me wrong, that have you know, multiple of these and they are feeling it. But you don't try to change each one and try to get it back to that biomechanical, this is what you should do because this is how the foot should work, is extremely tough, extremely hard, and it never sticks. By giving some back the freedom to express themselves and not judging them on how they actually are moving, for me, has been one of the easiest things I've ever I've gone to and has given the person back movement where they never had before. And within that, not only are you working with the principle of biking ontology from an internal perspective, you are changing their cognitive and their psychology around the actual activity. Mm -hmm. And to me, biochemistry ontology is just so much more than is it the bone, is it the muscle, is it the fascia? It's the whole. It's the whole. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, from a biochemistry ontology perspective, all we are is a bunch of information. We are just a big bag of information coming from multiple different external sources, coming from internal sources that are going through multiple different channels and multiple different factors. We are just a bunch of information. And the greater we can get the information together and the safer that information is being used in, and that's a key word, safety. From an evolutionary perspective, we are here to survive. And if any of my information feels under threat, I am going to show you that in all kinds of different mannerisms, both behaviorally and both physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are, we are organizational creatures that will self organize, our, self organize ourselves according to how safe we feel in our environment. And to me, giving back some of the freedom of movement, the expression of movement, 
giving back self-image and self-confidence and self-efficacy, giving back values and beliefs and all the things that yoga did and still does in certain, that Feldenkrais did, that uh, all the somatic uh, practitioners did, that Ido Rolf did, all these ideologies mm-hmm. is giving us back the freedom, not just through our body, and producing all the balconies on toys that we had once we had once we had that we still have embedded in us. It's just at the moment things have gone mechanical because your thought process is mechanical. Mm-hmm. It also gives you back freedom of the whole expression. And this is that whole thing where I was like, so I was seeing so many yoga, Pilates to a degree, Alex Golden Klai, somatic practitioners, Idle Rife practitioners, all geniuses at their work justifying what they were doing with biomechanical ideologies and, and knowledge and, and principles because they had they felt somehow they had to make it sound sexier than it was and for me it was the upsetting thing when i watch a class and go wow that's amazing but you've just killed it by saying no you know you're working the knee and the knee oh okay you just <laughs> you just killed it now uh and, and i think that the book was the book was to say biomechanics has its place its place is not entirely into in, in human movement. It has mm. its place around human movement and instruments that can be used for human movement. It doesn't have its place in human movement. It's a tool. So let's find other language. It's a tool. So let's yeah. find other language to use that gives us the, you know, something close, because we're never going to find it, but something mm. closer to the structure of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said, my friend. Very well said. So this, this accessing, accessing people's awareness, how, can you explain a little bit more exactly how you're doing that? I think one of the key things in, 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 in brain move, uh, that we work on, we work on multiple different factors. I think one of the things to give someone back awareness, uh, not, not only to their body, but their mind is, and it sounds a little bit, different against what most people say is to teach them not to care. What I mean by that is if someone cares deeply about something, their focus will remain completely on what they care about. And that's, that's not a bad thing. I care about my family more than life itself. So my focus will always be on my family's safety and looking at the hierarchy of needs within, are they sheltered? Are they fed? Are they watered? Are they safe? Are they protected? That's not a problem. If I focus too much on me, and how I move, I'm going to, by the law of the nature, by law of us being logical creatures in the social environment that is now embedded within what you can do and you can't do by rules and regulations that weren't designed by me or you, they were designed by society, and we have to somehow fit ourselves into society because if we don't, then we look a little bit bad and we're going to be the outlier and we're going to, most people don't want to be that, and that's completely understandable, and there's reasons why. But if an individual is having that frame of mind and they're focusing in purely on their body, they are always going to be critical of what they do. Mm-hmm. And if they're critical of what they do, they're always going to go back to what is current in the movement ideology world. And that is they'll always go back to, well, I shouldn't be doing this or I can't do this or this looks too hard for me and I can't do that. And, that, and they will always then maybe seek out an expert and the next but they may speak by mechanical language, which then reinforces what they think anyway. Mm-hmm. Giving back someone's awareness in the body is, can be as simple as saying, don't care what you do, just do. This don't is, this don't, is, don't this think, is, just do. I think Nike said that once, didn't they? Don't think, just... Just do it, I think. That, is there, is, is just there do a it. And that's it. Just do it. Yeah. Just do it. So, Honestly, if it hurts and it's painful, you're not going to want to do that. But you, you, it's your, your choice not to right. do that in movement, right. not somebody else saying you can't do that. Don't th- I've, I've said it for years, don't think, just do. Well, th- this is where, this is something that's, that's, that is what I try to tap to tap, tap into with sessions with my clients as well. And there's something I, I always say to clients is I trust their intuition way more than I trust my own knowledge. Yeah. And I, I have found that it, their own intuition on what's going on in their body is 99.9% correct. And sure, there's a variability in there. That's why I throw that, throw that in there. But when people look at 
the Dr. Rolfs, the Feldenkrais, the, the, the Alexander Technique, the, you know, whoever it may be, these people that have created these methodologies, there's a, a lot of uh, guru sense, you know, uh, guru sense to these people. So they, they, get, they end up giving their power over to these, these people. I've seen it many times. I've studied many different modalities and I've, I've watched yep. this happen over and over again. But what's interesting is, is, is that each one of those people, the Rolfs, the Alexanders, every one of them had some kind of personal challenge that they overcame. And what they essentially have done is, is found their own explanation of how to un- overcome those challenges from their own intuition, so to speak. And so they're speaking their, their creativity with their methodology, but it, and, and some, people, some people resonate with that, some people don't. And every one of them were, was in a place that, that they needed to find their expression like you're talking about. Yeah. And that's one of the w- most wonderful things is to watch a client find their expression um, and you've really taken it, you've really taken it down a road that I find uh, very inspiring and fascinating. Uh, as I as I continue my own practice, I, I'm I'm in that same funnel that that you've gone towards, and that's why I really enjoyed reading your book. Uh, so, when you're working with somebody, would you say that? that the resistance to whatever change or the fear of, of that change is most their biggest hurdle to, to get over through their, through their process? Yeah, 100%. I think one of the key things that I, I teach on Brain Move is, I, and I say this all the time, I try to keep as things as simple as I can. I, I look and I teach on the Brain Move courses is, there's 7 billion people on the planet and each one's going to survive in the environment that they're living in. So I will survive according to my, where I am in my, in my house or my, my job or my, my social interaction, my friends, my, my family, etc. And you'll do the same. And I will then have to live in the UK and you live in the States and you know, everyone lives in their own different environment. And it's the social needs of that environment that actually for most people actually program and condition that person. So what is taboo in one is not taboo in the other. What is accepted in one is not accepted in the other. So one of the key things I I teach people all the time is even though that goes on, there's still a hierarchy of needs. From a psychological perspective, there's still a hierarchy of needs. We still have this biological needs of am I going to be fed and am I going to be watered and am I going to be sheltered and do I have enough bargaining currency to to buy food and am I loved and am I contributing and am I doing something of true value and am I living a life that I want to lead and all these kinds of basic evolutionary hierarchy needs that we have. Now what people don't understand, if you want to live a life, let's say in direction A, and you are not living that B because the social norms are not allowing you to live life A, you are in complete conflict with yourself. There is no ifs, there is no buts about it. If you're not living your values and you're putting a face in the Sarah to somebody else or, a, or to the bigger well because there's a fear factor, there's an embarrassment, there's your identity has been lost, someone once upon a time said you can't do things, there's unhappiness around it, all kinds of different emotions, which when you think about it, no emotion's real. It's just a word. Nothing is real until you put the word to it. No such thing as fear until you say fear and then one then makes up an interpretation of fear. It's just a feeling. And if someone's not living a life that they really want to leave, but they are living a complete opposite, there is always going to be internal conflict. So when you're looking at are you living your true values? And I always say this to, to everybody, if you do, and are you doing it? Now, you're going to get questions back, I'm going to go to the moon, etc. And I can't, make you, I can't make you go to the moon. 
But the question will remain is that you are not living anything like you want to live. So each moment of your life, you are living in an artificial world, both externally and internally. And this is conflict. And if you want to talk about how does the physical body become a mechanical, it's because you're living that life all the time. Because if you're living that type of existence and you are talking to yourself at night saying, oh, it's okay, I can justify why I'm doing it, you are completely lying to yourself. You're going to react and behave and be conditioned in certain situations which is going to be purely negative to your physical body. Your posture is always going to show the sign of defeat. Your movement's always going to be short. You're going to be too scared to move because not only are you too scared to move, you're too scared to take chances because chances are what gives you space and space is what you need to move in. So movement is just a lack of movement sometimes with people. It's just a lack of space. They don't want to progress further on, so they box themselves in. Movement is a luxury for, for, for all of us. We don't need to move to survive in this world to a degree. There's many people that don't move too well and survive for a long, 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 long life. Mm -hmm. So one of the key things I say to people is, if you can find something that makes you smile on a consistent basis and you notice how that feeling is in your body, you will see your physical body change in a second. Oh, yeah. What once was yeah. stiff is no longer stiff. Mm -hmm. What was once a posterior fascia line that is no longer stiff because there's no such thing as a posterior fascia line. It's just something that's there that's in, in print. But Ultimately, you change your shape. You change your shape. You change your biokinesiology by living the life that you want to live in the way that you want to live it with the resources you want to live it in. And the greatest thing about it is that there's going to be millions of us that have to do things in each day life that we don't really want to be doing. But it's the imagination that we want to keep mm -hmm. that gives us hope and a chance that we can succeed in that, that I'm planning for that, I'm predicting that, I'm seeing that, I'm reading about it, I'm smelling it, I'm seeing it on TV. I may not be doing it 100%, but I'm living internally through that. Mm -hmm. These are one of the key things, because if you don't live like that, you are always going to be in conflict. You're always going to have behavior issues that you don't want because your habit becomes stronger. This reminds me of um, another book that I'm reading right now. It's, it's, uh, it's, this, it's like the second or third time I've read it. I can't remember. Uh, it's called The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Have you read it? Okay. No, I haven't. No. Um, he covers a concept. Um, he doesn't come out and say directly in the, in the book um, the concept of is basically the concept of change, hmm. and where most most uh, self improvement uh, books and ideologies processes where they fail, and why why people tend to fail at them, and it's it's change change is is something that. I mean, everything that you're saying, I absolutely agree with. However, people resist change because it's so scary, right? Yeah. And what he's talking about in this book is ways to, to change from doing small things, yeah. doing the little things in life, yeah. and doing those little things that you know that you should be taking care of, but you're not taking care of. Yeah. And that... And when you don't do the little things, how much they compound over time. Mm. And take, take your example of you're not having fun anymore. Mm. And how your posture reflects that, the stiffness in your body reflects that, your relationships reflect that. Mm. But what is that inspiration? What is that fun that, that you love to do so much? Where is it in your life? Yeah. And, and even if it's a little thing, like you, like you mentioned earlier, dancing, you know, dancing in a room to your, your favorite music, dancing to, to you know, um, I love doing that. I love horsing around with, you know, and with my family at home, I'll, I'll dance to like Lady Gaga or something like, mm -hmm. like that, you know, it's like something nobody would ever expect me to do. And it's kind of funny right now because I'm revealing that now to the, to the world. But, right. but hey, you know, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and my, just to see the laughter on my kids' faces when I, when I do it makes it every worth that, that minute for me to do yeah. that. And yeah. that, that self-expression is so important. But, 
And I really agree with you about the societal pressure fitting inside that box of, no, you're not allowed to do this. You, 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 or yeah. man, man shouldn't cry or, or, or yeah. men, you know, whatever. All those, I, all, those, all those constraints that we have and how much is yeah. it stifling and limiting, limiting us. Yes, without a shadow. And I think, I, think some, I think sometimes the current sort of mindset, the mind ideology side world is the intentions are great, but one of the members at night, because you can only change if you accept there's, a, there's an issue or something not quite right. Most people are not going to accept that they're wrong. We're, we're, our evolution is not designed for us to accept that we're wrong because that makes us a weaker species and we still have that even if you process that if I'm the weaker species, I may not survive on this planet. So but, that's why we lie. That's why, that's why we lie a lot because right. we have to be right all the time. So to tell someone, <laughs> to tell someone actually, yes, you need to relax more or you need yeah. to meditate more. It's like, so you're telling me I'm wrong. Right. Well, also, automatically that, that, that makes them threatened. Right. But automatically they're going to stand there and either do one or two things. They're going to, or three things. They're going to stand there and literally want to fight you verbally or physically. They're right. going to run away from you or just completely disassociate either way. Right. By you saying you should relax more or you should meditate more or we should make your behavior a little bit better. We can work on your, your happiness. Uh, imagine if I said to you now, oh, yeah, you, you, yeah, you look a bit down. Let's go and work on your positive happiness. Go through oh, yeah. positive psychology. You'd be like that. So you're telling me I'm not happy then. It's like, <laughs> okay. Uh, wait, wait, Stephen, are you saying yeah. I'm not happy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but, but what, the, paradox, the, the paradox of that is, is that human beings are trial and error creatures we learn by being wrong. Yeah. And here, 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 here we are. In the, this, in this, what you're saying is that we're not allowed to be wrong. No. But we're born to be wrong yeah. and to continue to contradict ourselves so that we learn yeah. and we grow and we, we, I'm one, we inspire. I'm one of the key things that I always teach people, and, 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 I, and I've, been, I've been a bit more vocal of it recently because, like I say, I think sometimes just being real sometimes is... is, is 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 needed is you can't please everybody and please don't try to please everybody people will hate you this is the law of the land people will hate you oh, for yeah. no reason whatsoever people will hate you mm -hmm. you cannot affect most people you ever meet you cannot change someone unless they want to be changed you have no influence over someone else's decisions okay you will die okay we will all die okay mm -hmm. so let's, let's let's not let's not cut around that and you will f u c k up all the time okay now that's quite basic and that's quite layman but it's the truth and if we can accept that we will mess up a hell of a lot a hell of a lot and we're designed to mess up so you're not going to get it right so there's no point being perfectionist because you'll never be perfectionist that's right. both in mind body spirit and and everything else people will hate you you will not get the job interviews that you really deserve people will overlook you for promotions Girlfriends will leave you. Divorces will happen. You will find money difficult at times. This, this is reality. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is the, this is the reality world we're living in. Okay? You cannot, you cannot change someone as they want to be changed. You can offer all the vice in the world, but you, can't lead the, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Mm -hmm. okay? Eight out of ten things that you stress about in your everyday life mean absolutely nothing within 24 hours after you've thought about them. And the two things that you probably do have to worry about probably come back to a decision you've made that's upset someone else in the past. So all you've got to do is pick up the phone and, and, and talk to them. Mm -hmm. So most of, most of life is pretty basic if you think about it. It's all, like I say, it's all about trial and error. So when you accept a lot of these things that people won't hate you, it, it, you start to express yourself knowing that I don't really care what you think of me. When you know that you know, your timeless planet is going to be very fleeting, when someone does upset you, it's going to, not going to make much difference. Well, you might have emotion. You might you might have emotions from it. Yeah, and you, you have to you have to have emotions from it. Yeah, and and just but emotions are not permanent. No, and I mean if you I allow know. them to flow through you, yes. then then yeah, they're not permanent. But if you stuff them down, then okay. yes, then that creates, that's, that's what I understand. It's like, not it's not the it's not me saying to you something that makes you emotionally upset. Right. That's not where the trigger starts. It's when you think about it a second later and try to question and justify what I've said. Then it becomes real. It doesn't become real until you think about it. Mm -hmm. When you think about what I've said, if I'm upset, if I'm, if I'm uh, horrible to you, then it becomes real. 
yeah. then you own then you've owned it <laughs> then you've then you've owned it the fucking fucking steven man who's telling yeah. me this shit <laughs> And 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 some and, and that and that's something. You know, those little those little pieces of information are very basic, are very, but they're the truth. You you know you have to live from 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 that perspective, from a psychological perspective. You live in the environment that you are currently in. So if you, and I say this all the time. So if you think that if you're going to live your life being very, um, that's why disappointed, but but be angry when someone cusses. You need to go to a country where no one cusses, because in a Western society, everyone's going to cuss to a degree. Well, okay? it's a, it's it to be able to cuss is there was some research that I saw on it that how it actually decreases pain. It, it I mean, it's an expression. It's an expression, it and it's it's one of those, I mean, if you're pissed off and you start swearing, I mean, that's helping you get through it. You know, spot on the the release of anger. The emphasis on the swear word, that means you remember something. The reduction in pain, the reduction in mm-hmm. anxiety, all are beneficial to, to individuals that swear on a flowing basis. But the, the, the thing is, if you're going to be upset by certain things that society is going to give you on a consistent basis, then you need to either move to society that doesn't have those conflicts or accept that that's the way it is at the moment. And you can change... Can you change the concepts? Probably not. You can change your association to those concepts. Mm-hmm. And that's when people say, let it go through you. I'm a bit more layman. Let it go through means I don't give an F-U-C-K. <laughs> you know, right. in, you know right. I don't, I, it, in that sound, that sounds like I'm, that I do care about things, but there's things that I don't care about. Because ultimately, mm-hmm. all it's going to do, is going to, it's going to change my self-image, my self-preservation, reduce my self-awareness, definitely reduce my self-expression. Keep mm-hmm. me in a threat mechanism. Keep me in a sympathetic state or, or highly aroused parasympathetic state uh, uh, act- activation. It's definitely going to let me question everything that I do. That's only going to lead to me questioning my own movement. That's mm-hmm. only going to let me box me into a small environment. I can't move. I can't move. I can't move. Oh, it hurts. I definitely can't move. That's definitely going to make me mechanical. And then somebody along the line, if I go to a therapist, may use the word biomechanics to justify why I am what I am. And then I go, ah, now you've given me a term and a word and some form of system that, oh, I can speak to my friends. Yes, it's because my biomechanical posture is not good. Or it's because my, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, you've mm-hmm. embedded an artificial lie upon an artificial lie based on an artificial lie that you take yeah. as the truth. And, and then I, that's cool. And that's cool. I've been guilty of that myself. That, that's, that's, that's the whole modern world. I mean, right. And that's the modern world. Right. You know, that's the modern world. But if your client, when they come to you, is feeling something unsafe, in the society and the social interactions that they're living in, mm-hmm. then they're going to be they're going to be threatened when they leave your premises an hour later. Yeah, absolutely. I still, I still have to go back to that same. I hate my job. I hate my life. I hate my wife. I hate. Now, can you change that? No. Can you change the perception of that? Yes. The perception can change, and that's where changes occur when you change the perception. Is it, are, th- are things going to be bad at times for you? Yes. But is there always a flip side to the coin? Yes. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times when I have clients that I hate my work, I go, okay, cool, cool, what do you want to do? Hey, can you do that? No, but what's the flip side of your work? Well, I'll get paid. Oh, that's, money's not a bad thing in society. You've got a nice yeah, house yeah. and you take your kids on holiday and you can feed your wife. You're providing as a man, you're providing. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I don't even really thought about it that way. Okay, the job still could be shit, but you perceive it differently. Absolutely. And that might be enough for you to then think about something else to do, or a lot of the times it might be enough to get you out of the pain when you're finding pain issues. Because Mm -hmm. when pain comes and you know it's associated with their social interaction, it's not there all the time. It's only where when they are threatened in that social interaction. I've many times I've had clients I've gone, they've got it doesn't hurt on a Monday, but it hurts on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, okay, Friday's bad again, you know. <laughs> what do you what are you doing Tuesday and Thursday? There. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing Tuesday and Thursday? Nothing major, just at work. No, <laughs> what are you doing at work on Tuesday that you don't like? Oh yeah, three o'clock comes around, I've got to do this these paperwork and I hate it. Okay, cool. When's it hurt? Oh actually, yeah, three o'clock. Okay. <laughs> you know? So it, so what you do so there's something at three o'clock that you're doing that is physically uh, responsive to the psychological element of doing some particular task that you are struggling to do. Can we find ways to make that task better? 
Because if we can, we're going to find that that three o'clock is a completely different time right. the next time. You're not going to have the same habit because that's all movement dysfunction or pain is, is the same habit being repeated over and over and over again with no understanding of why it's happening, but a confirmation of, oh, well, this is the way it is because then somebody else is enforcing me that that is mechanically the way it should be because I have to justify your body by a mechanical principles of a stick figure, which has one bone for the spine and one bone for the leg and one big skull that doesn't move. Okay. So uh, uh, there's a quote that I want to read uh, from the, the book, The Slight Edge, that there's a, there's a section or chapter on the, in the book that they're, um, they're talking about happiness. And the quote, one of the quotes that they use in the book is, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. And there he's overviewing about the, what science, science has about happiness. And it was a few years ago, uh, Dr. Seelgman, Seelgman uh, started researching happiness. And, and it's, a lot of it is what you're talking about is having that gratitude for what you do have. Yes. Yes. And, and it's when you don't have that gratitude that it's stifling. It's, it's, yes. it's life sucks. Yes. And, and then you start resenting everything and then you start having expectations and then there's more resent and it just, yes. it just, you know, it snowballs from there. Yeah. I love the, it. The, the, yeah. The, the, the amount of emotional words you can, you can Google will be frightening. Uh, and they're all just words with some form of interpretation and a bit like biomechanics is that I say the word fear and then everyone has that feeling of fear but then who gave the word fear in the first place so if it had been elephant then everyone would have reacted to the elephant so the word doesn't really mean a great deal it's the association with the word but when you look at all those uh, emotional words and you look at the, the, the attachments associated with those a lot of those are due to not accepting and not having gratitude Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but a lot of them are down to not accepting, whether that's the past, whether that's the present, whether it's the future, whether it's anything in your life, not accepting things are going to be like they are at times because you have no control over them and accepting that the past is the past. And even though you can go back in time psychologically and, and, and reframe different situations, that past has gone. Mm -hmm. and, and, being gratitude and being grateful for what you have because if you want to be clinical about it, you just got to show a bunch of pictures from different societies in the world and we can see how grateful we are, even though we might not like our government or our politics or our leaders or anything like that. When you actually look on paper and compare ourselves with other countries and other people, we should be more than grateful. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> beyond, absolutely. Beyond anything else. Yeah. So when you look, so when you, when you just take those two and you give someone the realization of that, a lot of those emotional words that you find that you can Google, just disappear. Yeah. That, just that's, disappear. That's, that, that's like having a gratitude journal. If you have a gratitude journal, if you write one thing a day that you're, grat you're grateful for, I forget the, what the percentage is. Uh, there was some research done on it that, you know, if your pay increases by such and such percent, then your, 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 hap your happiness goes up, you know, 5% or whatever. But if you do a gratitude journal, it goes up like 20 to 30%. I can't remember the exact. So, I'm, um, don't, yeah. don't quote me on those, on those percentages, yeah, yeah, yeah. that gratitude journal, you know, having that gratitude journal, focusing on that gratitude. Yeah. I, I did it for, uh, I still do it actually. I, I did it for a year and I noticed a definite difference, especially like those, yeah. like those, those little voices in your head that talk to you and say, Oh, you're shit, you know, or this and that. And those, most of them disappeared. Just yep. focusing on just you know retraining my brain to focus on on gratitude instead of instead of the shit things in life. Yep, and I find I think the third thing you can, uh, I, I tend to add in there it's a lot is, and it's probably the harder one to do. But when you understand that people will hate you just because they want to hate you, and people won't like you because they just don't want to like you, right. is other, other people's success is a thumbs up, but it shouldn't define your success. Absolutely, it shouldn't, def it shouldn't define your failures. Because ultimately, if you want to look at clinically, the person who's got success in a different part of the country to you that you don't know, that you're Googling and Facebooking and wishing you was like, actually doesn't know you and actually 
doesn't care about you. So you know, they're projecting some shit on you, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's like you're, 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 you're perceiving things that haven't even happened after. So, you know, not, not associating yourself with other people's success or failures, not being, not, not jumping up in joy when someone pats you on the back and not being defeatist when someone says you're not good enough. Everything's, mm. everything's learning. And we are here, like you say, to make mistakes and to grow and to learn and ultimately pass on to our next generation for them to do the same. And it continues down the line. And I think sometimes being ruined situations gives you the expansion to want to be your own person. And I think being your own person gives you expansion to want to move and the expansion of wanting, wanting to move takes you out of that mechanical body. Mechanical body, mechanical mind, free in body, free in mind. And uh, for me, that's well, King's ontology can be, you know, can be taken into, you know, freedom in society for yourself. A self-expression is freedom in, in B.R. King's ontology. And I think that's the beauty thing that I think I will leave the, the people in this, uh, for this, this podcast is do everything you can just to be yourself. People don't like you. Who don't like you? As long as you love yourself, that's all you're going to be worrying about. Mm-hmm. Be yourself. Express yourself. There is no right or wrong. It's your interpretation of how you feel at that moment, and never be afraid to suppress that. Yeah, you well, know. Uh, and that's well, the beauty. I think that's a perfect place to wrap it up. Um, we'll put in the show notes uh, where people can find you. Uh, is unless you unless there's something else that you want, one more thing that you'd like to say to everybody. No, I think I'm, I'm quite an easy guy to catch. You can find me on Facebook, uh, Stephen Braybrook. Go to brainmoveeducation.com, themoverman.com. The Evolution of Biomechanics book's out. Uh, plenty more projects uh, coming up. Uh, I'll send you the links and hopefully you can put them on. Uh, I'll definitely put them on. And yes, dep- you know, be free in body, guys, and be free in mind. Uh, and uh, you live a life and a body that will give you all the expression that you want to express. And that's, to me, that's a true, that's, that, that's a true biomechanics. Right there with you, man. Right there with you. Thank you so much for being on the show. And I hope to have you again on, at some point. And when, I had one more question. Uh, when, sh- you have another book coming out soon? I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of writing it now. Uh, I'm dyslexic. So when I say a book coming out, I, I, get, pre, I get a little bit, Free and uh, dyslexic individual writes a book, and then another dyslexic individual proofreads it, and that takes double the time. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm in the process now of of writing uh, writing one. So it's uh, it's it's on the go. So that's that's right. a good thing. I uh, I know I know your pain on that because I'm dyslexic too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I don't. Have you read the book by uh, Gail Saltz, The Power of Difference? Yes, love love that book, and I love. Yeah. I love the, the empowerment for, for uh, dyslexia and in that book and uh, the gift of dyslexia. Definitely. So congratulations on your dyslexia and your I different view so. of the world. And uh, I look forward to your next book and, and speaking to you further in the future. Thanks so much, Jeremy Isaac. And uh, yeah, have a great day and uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks. Thank you for watching the Body Align Pro podcast. For more information, visit bodyalignpro.com. You can download the app for free on the Apple App Store. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Be sure to check out the show notes for links. If you are enjoying this, please be sure to subscribe and share this with your friends and family. Once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.